Oh, hi. How are you doing? Are you all right? Ready for part three of our story, The Girl Who Stole an Elephant by Nizrana Farouk. You remember? Yeah, we already did chapter one, chapter two, and chapter three. So today we'll do chapter four and chapter five. All right. Before we start, there's a couple of words that I had a flick through and they were new words to me. So I'm just going to treat them as new words for everybody. Here's one of them. Bougainvillea. That's a kind of flower. All right. Bougainvillea or a kind of plant. And Betel, there it is, all right. Um, I googled what betel was, and it's a kind of leaf that can be eaten. Anyway, here we go with chapter four and chapter five. You ready? Oh, yeah, before I start, remember yesterday, um, where um, the jewels were hidden, the merchant and his daughter were in the shop, weren't they, in the carpenter's shop, and that the daughter took the box. She liked the box where the jewels were hidden. Oh no. Let's see what we can find out next, shall we? The box seemed to mock Chaya from the girl's hands. She felt like snatching it off her right there and then. The merchant frowned at the two-headed bird on a lid. That's an odd-looking carving. Choose something else, Nawa. Chaya sprang at Nawa and gripped the box, her hands tight on the smooth, varnished wood. Your father's right. This one's really ugly. Look, there's nicer boxes over there. But Nawa wouldn't let go holding on to it in spite of Chaya's efforts. Sorry, she said, her voice soft but firm at the same time. I like this one. Actually, that box is somebody else's, said Neil. I've already promised it. I have to deliver it later today. The carpenter stared at Neil. You're taking orders from me now, boy, are you? Keep your mouth shut. He swiped his hand to make Neil step away. It's a shame you like this particular one, though, said Chaya, still holding tight. It has um, a defect. That's true, said Neil Holden from where he had retreated to behind the mahogany cabinet. The little drawer keeps getting stuck. Oh, we don't want it then, said the merchant. Yes, we do, father. Now I tugged at the box. I like it. Not to worry then, said Chaya. It's easily fixable. Neil will work on it and bring it to you tomorrow. I don't mind really, said Now, taking a hand off to slide the drawer open and shut repeatedly. It looked like it was gliding on oil. But I insist, said Neil. That's not except... Neilan, said the carpenter. Enough. What's the meaning of this? Know your place, boy. Miss Chaya, you better leave. And you, boy, another word from you. He glared at Neil. Chaya backed out of the workshop, feeling now as eyes boring into her all the way. She hesitated in the doorway. The merchant's expression furrowed as he looked from the carpenter to Neil to Chaya. Now, why not take something else? Look, this one has a lotus flower. It looks much nicer. Chaya nodded to herself. Yes, put your foot down, Naya's father. What a spoiled child that Nawa was. But this one's nicer. I like the pattern. And it's also... Nawa's eyes darted to Chaya, and there was a faint smirk on her face. It's also heavier than the others. She turned back to the carpenter. We'll take this one. Chaya watched from behind a clump of papaya trees. A breeze whistled through the trees, blowing wisps of hair into her eyes and whipping at her plait. She had retreated from the workshop but watched, hands on head, as her precious jewels were being taken away. The merchant stepped outside, now followed behind, her floaty red gown swishing through the green of the paddy field. They threaded their way along the path, now holding onto the box like a prize in her hands. She wasn't going to work it out, would she, was she? Neil's handiwork had to be too clever for her. The thought of the jewels being discovered was too much to bear. The merchant passed Chaya first, talking to Nawa over his sh shoulder in a foreign tongue. He was quite unlike his daughter, big and broad-shouldered, with a swarthy face under his white turban in the style of their people. Nawa tripped along after him, leaving a smell of warm sand and jasmine behind her. At the end of the fields a carriage waited, and now I got in, followed by her father. They left by the cartway, skirting the village toward the king's city. Chaya watched them go before sprinting along the river path. It was a shortcut that she had taken many times, through thorny shrubs that ripped her skirt. She'd just have to face her auntie's wrath later.
Stopping outside the gates into the city, Chaya crept up behind the old war bell. The trundle of wheels followed shortly after, and Nawa and her father swept in through the entryway. Chaya followed at a leisurely place, at pace as she'd seen the carriage stop at the market and Nawa get down at a lace stall. The seller measured out and bundled several lengths into fat rounds for Nawa. Then she got back into the carriage and they moved on again, taking the little bridge over the lotus-speckled river to the residential part of the city. This was where all of the big villas were, standing in gardens of shady trees thick with frangipani flowers. The carriage turned into a street and stopped at a large house at the end. So this was where Nawa lived. More importantly, this is where the box was going to be. Not for long, though, because Chaya was going to get it back. She smiled from her position behind the wall as Nawa took the box inside. The next day, Chaya sat on a park bench watching the merchant's house. The stone seat felt cool under her at this time of the morning, and a minor bird twittered on a frangipani branch overhead. The merchant went out soon after, striding away towards the market, but the sun was high in the sky before Nawa came out. She was accompanied by a round-faced woman with a headscarf tied under her chin who waddled down a street in arm with her. Finally! Chaya sped up the street towards the house after giving Nawa a good five minutes to get away. Chaya was dressed in her usual thieving get-up, a set of ragged old clothes she kept hidden from auntie in a drawer. It was surprising how invisible poor people were. Nobody ever noticed Chaya when she dressed like this. The villa was a typical rich person's house, large and single-storied, with a veranda twice the size of Chaya's, filled with dark, heavy furniture. One look at the house and Chaya knew this was going to be easy. The gate was open, but there was a man watering the garden. No problem. Front entrances were the most guarded part of a house anyway. Same with the back. Always a gaggle of servants chatting there. She wasn't going to enter through either of them. Chaya headed to the side of the house, which was partly covered by a mound of tall bushes. Just as she thought, this side wasn't overlooked from the street. She stood for a minute, casually checking to see if anyone was around, then ran up and leapt up onto the window ledge. She wasn't going to get in through the window. Oh no, people were careful with windows. That's how thieves got in after all. She reached up to the roof and hooked one foot over, hauling herself up. The roof tiles were scorching under her bare feet as she tiptoed away across, careful not to dislodge anything. Voices came from the back of the property. She got to the middle of the house and there it was, the weak point of every rich man's villa, the courtyard. Chaya lay flat on the roof and peered down into the house, squinting till her eyes adjusted to the light. A well-tended garden with sprays of pink bougainvillea lay in the, lay in the centre, edged with thin pillars holding up into the roof of the inner veranda. A servant girl cleared crockery from a small table set with a bench. No one else was in sight at all. Chaya watched the girl leave, cups and saucers clinking on a tray, then dropped down into the garden, landing lightly on the spongy grass. The girl was walking away down a wide corridor. Chaya rolled over and stepped behind a brass standing lamp. She heard the clinking stop and sensed the girl turn back to look. People never noticed anything when you were still. What they did notice was movement. Chaya stood motionless. imagining the girl's puzzled face looking in her direction. A clock ticked somewhere, counting out the seconds. The tray clinked again as the girl went on her way. Chaya stole out and pushed open a highly polished door set with a brass ring for a handle. Inside was a four-poster bed and rich maroon furnishings. A tapestry on the wall had a pattern like the one Neil had been working on, all geometric shapes laid out in stars and triangles. On a stand was a blue-edged length of cloth with that was the turban the merchant had worn yesterday. Chaya tiptoed back out. The next door was open, a patterned curtain fluttering across it. This was a sitting room with low couches arranged around a big woven rug. This wasn't the room she wanted either. As she brushed her way through the curtain, a man walked towards her, fiddling with an incense burner. Chaya nipped back behind the curtain. She was conscious of her feet showing underneath, but stayed still to avoid a flash of movement. She stiffened as the man passed on the other side, so close she could smell the bitterness of Betel on his breath. His footsteps receded towards the back of the house. 
Chaya crept out to the adjoining corridor. It led to a dining area with tall windows at the end. A delicious smell came from a tray on a sideboard near her. She lifted up the fly cover on it. There was some kind of fried sweet coated and pow with powdered sugar, still warm and smelling of syrup. Her mouth watered and fingers itched to pop one in her mouth. She dropped back the cover and crept out. She was crossing the courtyard to the rooms on the other side when she heard footsteps. The servant girl was back. Chaya shimmied up the nearest pillar. She wrapped her legs around the top of the pillar, splayed on the ceiling like a gecko, hands gripping the roof gutter for support. That was another thing about people. They never looked up. She was stretched to the maximum, her arm muscles thrumming with the strain. The servant girl was right underneath, taking her time with the crockery. She hummed a tune and laid cups and spoons daintily on a tray. Chink, chink. Chaya's arms and hips were on fire. Chink, chink. She breathed in and out slowly, willing herself to hold on. Chink, chink. Oh, how long was the silly fool going to take? Chink. Chink. She was going to fall. She couldn't hold any more. Her body started to sag and she fought to grip the gutter with her sweaty fingertips. Tips. The servant girl left, still humming her tune. Chaya dropped down and leaned on the pillar, catching her breath and massaging her aching arms. There was no time to lose. She bounded up to a panelled door across the courtyard and pushed it open. The first thing it hit her was the smell of jasmine. Mm. She had found Nawa's room. It had a smaller four-poster bed with a steamer trunk at the foot of it. A painting of a woman quite like now hung on a wall. On a dressing table were hairbrushes and scent bottles, but right in the middle of the table was now Neil's wooden box. Chaya rushed over to it and snatched it up. Finally, this nightmare could end. The two-headed bird etching shone softly on the varnished lid as she opened it and fiddled with a secret catch. A sound of cartwheels startled her as a carriage crunched to a halt outside the house. Chaya snapped the lid shut. There was no time. She had to get out. She'd open it at home. She closed the door softly behind her as she padded back to the courtyard. A high-pitched scream <coughs> made Chaya freeze. The servant girl was standing at the table, her infernal tray in hand staring straight at Chaya. She'd come back for a single cup that she'd left on a table. A silly idiot! The house stirred to attention as voices and footsteps hurried towards them. Sorry, sorry, I'm leaving, Chaya said to the girl. She had no intention of meeting the rest of the household. She threw the box in a high arc onto the roof where it landed with a crash, sending a tile sliding down. Chaya leapt up and grabbed onto the gutter, swinging for a moment before pulling herself up to the roof. She plucked the box from where it had fallen and scrammed. She slid down the rest of the roof, tiles scouring the backs of her legs. At the lip, she plummeted down and landed on her feet by the side of the house. Behind her, a back gate clattered open and footsteps scuffled in Chaya's direction. She ran for it. Down the city streets and through the market, she went zigzagging past mounds of amborella fruit and cane basket displays and sacks of cardamom and cumin then out of the city and past the old war belt and its crumble down plinth until she was sure that she wasn't being pursued anymore at home she went straight to her room to change and hide the box before auntie saw her she shut the door and flopped down on the bed hugging the box to her the thought of Nara's face when she got home and saw the box gone made her laugh <laughs> uh, served now right for trying to mess with her really didn't it the lid had come loose, but otherwise the box was fine. Chaya top tapped and prodded it the way Neil had shown her until she heard the click that released the hidden compartment. She took out the drawer and saw the dark shapes nestling amongst the wood dust. Phew. She lifted out one of them, leaving a trail of wood dust on her bedsheet. No! Chaya yelled. She turned the box over and shook the contents out, dumping a dusty mound of pebbles onto her bed no 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 the thief the horrible thief chaya scrambled in the wood dust for the jewels but all she found was old pebbles every single one of the queen's jewels was gone her fingers closed on a scrap of paper among the wood dust she shook it off it was a note a very short one nice try now nah. Oh my goodness. How had she found the secret compartment? How? What was Nawa going to do with the Queen's jewels? Was she going to tell? Was she going to keep them for herself? Oh my goodness. This gets more and more exciting by the day, doesn't it? Okay. Have a lovely day. I'll see you tomorrow.
拜。